Welcome back, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us uh, for our second panel uh, today on democracy and nuclear energy in Brazil after uh, the military regime. Uh, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, our three speakers um, for, for this panel. Um, so I'll uh, give a, a, a short introduction uh, to each of them before we, uh, we hand over to, to our speakers. Uh, so first up, we'll be hearing from uh, Renata Hesman de Lacqua. Uh, so Renata is head of the Gender and Disarmament Program at uh, UNIDIR in Geneva. Uh, before joining uh, UNIDIR, she was the Deputy Director of Projects at the Brazilian Center for International Relations, uh, where she worked for six years. Uh, she's a recipient of the United Nations Women's Scholarship for Peace, uh, and Renata has conducted research and published on international cooperation uh, on security, disarmament, non-proliferation, and arms control, uh, as well as nuclear energy governance. Uh, she holds a PhD in History and Politics from the Getulio Vargas Foundation uh, in Brazil uh, and a Master's degree in International Relations and Security from University College uh, London in the UK. Uh, her areas of expertise include uh, gender and multilateral disarmament fora, uh, nuclear energy policy making and technology governance. And our second speaker uh, will be uh, Ricardo uh, Estevez. Uh, who is a PhD student in International Relations at the University of Sao Paulo uh, and is currently Technical Assistant to the Agriculture Attaché at the Embassy of Brazil in the UK. Uh, he holds a Master's Degree in Political Science uh, from the Federal University of, uh, of Goiás, uh, where he wrote a thesis uh, on the nuclear issue in Brazil's Assembly uh, for discussing a new constitution. And uh, then our third speaker will be Carlo Patti, uh, who, uh, as you'll know, is a professor of international relations uh, here at uh, the Federal University of Goiás, Brazil, uh, where, uh, among other things, he coordinates uh, the graduate program in political science. Uh, he received his PhD in history of international relations from the University of Florence in 2012. Uh, and his research focuses on Brazil's foreign policy, uh, Brazil's nuclear history, international history, nuclear diplomacy, and international security. Um, he published, uh, among other uh, notable works, uh, The Brazilian Nuclear Program, An Oral History, uh, and I think most recently, or uh, last year or so, um, his book, uh, Brazil and the Global Nuclear Order, uh, from 1945 to 2018. Uh, so I think our, uh, our, our speakers are very well qualified to, uh, to, to tackle the, uh, the, the, the topic uh, in, uh, in this panel. Um, so without further ado, I think I'll hand over to uh, Renata, who's joining us uh, and presenting us uh, uh, to, to us online uh, with a paper entitled uh, Atoms and Democracy in Brazil. So over to you, Renata. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. É um prazer estar com vocês. Um, I am based in Geneva but I actually um, did my research in Brazil and wrote my thesis in Portuguese and my slides are in Portuguese, so it'll be a bit of a, a mix between the two languages, um, but I hope uh, it, will, it will work out. But just to say for people in the audience, if after you would like to ask questions in Portuguese, that's completely fine as well. Um, so the starting point of my research was when I started my PhD many years ago, I think now it's 10 years, um, there was a vast literature on the nuclear program in Brazil during the military period, but not so much uh, but after um, 1988. So uh, I'm, I'm, I have a background in political science, so I was trying to look, you know, what are the main characteristics of the Brazilian nuclear program after 88? 1988 being the, the, the landmark of the new constitution, the democratic constitution, or as we call in Brazil, the citizen constitution. Um, so if we can go to, to the next slide um, and go a little bit further, I think uh, I'll skip some of the things. But yes, the idea was to understand main actors, um, the legal framework, um, and how we were thinking about uh, nuclear policy making as public policy in Brazil, uh, focusing mostly on the nuclear energy program. And because we, we, the, the, we were looking in this, I was looking at this under the framework of uh, a democratic constitution, also paying attention to understand what are the, the mechanisms for democratic control that appears in the, in the uh, nuclear policy. So if we can go to the next slide. 
a little bit further. What I did, I looked at three uh, case studies and then I compare them. Uh, so the case studies was, were, the first one was um, uranium mining in Bahia, uh, uranium enrichment in Hezende, and um, building the nuclear en uh, power plant in Angra. So you see the focus is very much on civilian applications, but as nuclear, um, it, it, because you know the, the the nuclear program in Brazil is for for civilian purposes, so I was I was looking at that. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I will go straight into the results. Um, in terms of main actors, uh, what are the, who are the, the protagonists in the? Um, nuclear uh, program of Brazil in the period I was looking, right, after 88. So I did my, my research went until 2016. So what I'm s sharing with you is, you know, my research, um, 88 to 2016, things may have changed since then. And I also welcome your feedback and, and look forward to discussing this further. But the period that I look, um, there was clear the protagonism of the president um, so the president was the one guiding the, um, the nuclear policy making through decrease, through um, announcement uh, and designating ministers and key actors in the nuclear sector. So this was something that was clear in my research. Um, the people nominated by the president, so the political appointees, they were the interface with something that I, I, I named the, the uh, technopolitical regime, autonomous, autonomous technopolitical regime of Brazil. And why did I choose this name? Because the notion of autonomy kept coming back, kept coming up. Uh, the, there was a lot of emphasis in autonomy when you engaged, when I did interviews and I researched about the Brazilian nuclear program. Um, so this technical, tech, technocratic aspect of the, the, the Brazilian nuclear program um, was very much um, structured around uh, Senem, the Navy, some sectors of diplomacy, some sectors of academia, and um, I will go into that a little bit further, but just to say that that was a very important set of actors that I, I identified in my research. Then another uh, important actor were the, the ministers, right? Uh, the energy ministers. And one thing that happens in a democracy is that in, in, one, in some democracies more than others, there's a lot of change among political actors. So in the period that I analyzed, there were a lot of uh, uh, turnout between ministers. And that actually was something that was identified as you know, part of the game, part of the political game, but something that can lead to delays and lead to discontinuities in the nuclear program in Brazil. So if we go to the next slide, I put a table there. It's a table uh, from an article I wrote um, and published in the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Review. So that article is focused on the autonomous technopolitical regime. This concept, technopolitical regime, comes from G Gabrielle Hest. So she did that uh, looking at the uh, um, nuclear energy program in France. I applied that same concept and identified, you know, uh, who are the set of actors in Brazil. And the material basis for this regime are the centrifuges. So the centrifuges, um, they are material bases that lead to claims, to policy prescriptions and to technological prescriptions. So uh, there is a, a, a very much a, a, an emphasis on keeping the the capabilities in the nuclear fuel cycle, maintaining the production of strategic materials inside Brazil, this very much idea of autonomy. And this idea of autonomy also appears in the uh, interface that Brazil has with the international regime, the nuclear non-proliferation regime. The idea that self-regulation is actually driving our commitments towards nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, there is this, this um, 
famous sentence by uh, uh, Rex Nazaré, we won't make the bomb because we don't want to make the bomb. So this idea of autonomy and self-regulation was very strong, was something that came up uh, very strongly uh, when I was doing this research. And then if we continue with the next slide, um, because I was coming from, you know, a framework of, you know, democracy. So the, the, what is the, the role of the parliamentarians that are elected in this democracy? And what is the role of the public debate and dialogue in the Brazilian nuclear program? So actually what came up out in my research is that parliamentarians had a secondary role. Um, they were very much following the lead of the executive. And I followed many um, law projects initiated by parliamentarians. And I could see that, you know, they had not so much of a, a, a great level of success. Um, and when it came to public debate, what was evident is that the biggest instance of public debate around nuclear project in Brazil was environmental licensing. And that appeared in the um, environmental licensing comes up, you know, when you, you're, you're opening a new uranium mine or, or when you were creating some in infrastructure for nuclear energy. And that's when you hear the population and the community. And it was interesting because people would come to those debates, to those instances of consultation with many requests and, main, and many ideas and many things they wanted to share. And not all of them were actually related to the um, project that was supposed to be debated. So you feel that they had broader considerations, the population had broader considerations that they would like to discuss, but there wasn't really an instance, a, a setting where they could do that. So it was a bit of a mismatch between what the population would discuss and actually what is the role of that uh, public consultation at the level of the, the environmental licensing. So if we go to the next, next slide also, uh, I looked at uh, the planning, policy planning, and uh, it felt very much technocratic in a way that, again, it's not really based on um, public polls, for instance. Uh, so it was very much driven by, you know, the, 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 the tech technocracy. And um, also, I was using a lot the um, Freedom of Information Act, as we have in Brazil, a lei de acesso à informação. And it was um, very, very helpful for my research. I got access to a lot of important information and I'm very um, pleased with this mechanism and how it worked. Again, things may have, I did my research between 2013 and 2016, 17, and I used a lot of requests of information, but even the law on requests of information has a paragraph that protects information related to research and development um, where, you know, um, the, the, its secrecy is important for um, society security and state security. So I put in the slide the specific um, article of the law. So sometimes I didn't get the, the information I was asking for and that was justified by the, the nature of the nuclear program, which sometimes uh, includes information related um, to um, security. And I, I don't think this is something that is singular to Brazil. I think this is probably how it is in most countries. Uh, if in, in participation, uh, in the next, yes. <laughs> so some gaps related to social participation. Um, for instance, this is not the type of policy, public policy, that is debated in orçamento participativo, in participatory budgets, for instance or in Conselho, Conselho de Política Energética, né? these councils that involve civil society to talk about new directives. Uh, I was listening to the first um, roundtable you had earlier today, and there was this discussion about what kind of energy do we want 
what kind of uh, costs are environmental costs, economic costs are we willing to to pay for ele generating electricity? So this this kind of discussion it didn't I, I I didn't find you know where do we have this type of conversations as a society? So this was something that I felt was missing in terms of uh, social participation. And again, uh, you could think, one could think of mechanisms for a more structured dialogue uh, to receive feedback or, you know, collaborative projects to foster trust. So in situations where you have a lot of mistrust, for instance, in uranium mining, you could think of a collaborative project uh, let's say monitoring impacts, but that is developed in partnership with society and that can be a way of, fost of fostering trust. If you go to the to the next slide, um, I looked at uh, supervision of, you know, oversight of activities, nuclear activities in Brazil. And I actually found a, a, quite, a quite diverse um, net of controls. So you had internal controls, external controls, parliamentarian controls. You had uh, IBAMA, so environmental con controls, uh, TCU, which is accounting, uh, Ministério Público, Polícia Federal. You know, you had there was there was something that if you would compare with the period before 1988, this was new and very positive. So we have a diverse set of actors performing oversight in the nuclear program. And I think since I finished my, my, my research, uh, there is a point to note that it's a strengthening of this control with the, the creation of a, a new uh, regula regulatory agency for, for nuclear security. Uh, if you go to the next slide, but as always, you know, there were a bit of gaps. Some gaps uh, I felt uh, were related to public health in Caetite, uh, social participation. One thing that struck me is was uh, when there were um, fines related to environmental issues, most of these fines were never paid. They just prescribed. So this is the type, you know, of like a control that is not really effective because if you know that you receive a fine that you never have to pay, that you can delay forever, what, what is the effectiveness of that? And something else that came up in my research was the issue of corruption. Uh, despite so many nets, so many different instances of control, you would still end up with some cases of, of, of corruption. Um, and I think maybe that's how it is. There is never something that is perfect, but maybe there is also things that, that can be improved. And I also noted in my research that even though you had the structural gaps, the individuals working in the sector were very much committed to security on a personal level. And this was something that struck me and was something that I highlighted in my research. So to conclude, um, there is the issue, you know, how you make, how do you combine democracy and nuclear technology? Because nuclear technology is very much marked by exceptionalism, by being, you know, something that can bring about nuclear Armageddon, and therefore it needs to be uh, protected in terms of uh, secrecy. So this ambivalence between nuclear materials and how you know you would you would um, have a democratic regime around it was something very much uh, a, a tension that came up in the different um, case studies I did. And because nuclear issues are so exceptional, you know, their dual use and their association of prestige in the international um, system. I had the impression, my analysis is that a lot of the times you were making, uh, the policy was based on strategic considerations and not so much in economic considerations. So there was a bit of, you know, the preponderance of strategic analysis uh, over economic analysis. And one instance where this happened was very much, for instance, the um, state monopoly of uranium. Um, one could argue from an economic logic, it would end up being in one way and, you know, from a state security logic would end up being another way. Uh, so this is just being very brief because, you know, the nuclearity 
had different shapes in different uh, parts of the nuclear fuel cycle. And then in my final slide, I just have a, a very big summary of everything I said, you know, what I identified as the characteristics of the poly, uh, nuclear policy in Brazil after 88. And uh, it's very much a project driven by the state with state funds. And this was also something I would like to highlight that in my research, talking to interlocutors, people working in the sector, they said, you know, um, working with a public budget, trying to perform, to implement a technological program that takes, you know, um, a very long term based on public resources was a challenge. Uh, because of fluctuations, because of instability, and you know, um, so I think the, the the characteristics I identify in my research they they make you think about the challenges of having democratic control over nuclear energy, but also the challenges of implementing such a project in a developing country facing sometimes you know um, economic constraints. So that was uh, it that I had to share with you today. Um, very much grateful for this opportunity to present a bit of this research and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Renata, for a fascinating presentation. Uh, now we'll hand over to our second speaker, uh, Ricardo, uh, with a presentation entitled uh, Nuclear Energy in the Constituent National Assembly from 1987 to 1988. Boa tarde. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for the for the invitation, Carlo and Jean. That's that's really really nice. So uh, I will talk a bit about the Constituent uh, National Assembly and how the nuclear issues were uh, treated during the the uh, Constituent. Uh, it's a very interesting topic because. Uh, the Brazilian uh, con uh, constituent was a place to discuss uh, the projects for a new country. So it was the real first democratic uh, discussion about our future. And it took place in, um, in a difficult time. So it was like 88, so 87, 88. And one of the topics, the main topics, was nuclear proliferation. Uh, uh, quite often, Carlo remembers me that at this time, the Cold War was not finished yet. So there was like a space uh, a, a race uh, with Reagan, and, and that, was, that was a real hot topic. And the interesting to uh, point is that the nuclear program was the geo of the of the army in Brazil, so they wanted to show the population, the world, that they did something, and that that was a a very important uh, it was a very important realization for them. So at the point that Brazil uh, would announce to the world that was uh, a country able to enrich like uranium and it was a country able to uh, produce nuclear weapons, it would put Brazil in another aspect. So Brazil would be part of the countries that have nuclear weapons instead of the countries that need to accept like a regime that, uh, that does not allow other countries to have nuclear weapons. And, and in the other side, there was uh, a growing left movements in Brazil that were very inspired by what was happening uh, in Europe, especially in Germany, uh, in the US as well. So it's important to remember that uh, in New York, like the demonstrations against uh, nuclear proliferation were like taking, uh, I think, almost one million people in the streets. And Brazil was inserted in this uh, in the in these aspects as well. So uh, when you when we think uh, the constituent, all these topics they were they were together, and because it was uh, very long, 
from February 1987 to July 1988, uh, a lot of things happened. And this, this is one of the main topics that I will talk uh, about today. So especially three, uh, three events during the constituent. Uh, the season accident that happened here in Goiânia. Uh, they discovered that the military had like a place to test nuclear weapons in Serra do Cachimbo, no Pará. And the declaration uh, between Alfonsin and Sarney, the, the president at the time from Argentina and Brazil, that uh, Brazil was, a, uh, was able, was capable to enrich uranium. So this these three things, they were extremely important to, to that story. So, but first, uh, before, before I forget, uh, what, what the constituent talks about nuclear, nuclear energy? Uh, first thing is, not all countries uh, regulate nuclear energy in its uh, constitution. Uh, just a few countries do that, and most of the countries they just uh, regulate nuclear energy to say that uh, basically the, the, main, the central government is the one that can control everything about nuclear. So uh, Brazil is, is an exception in this field. And more than Brazil, Latin America needs an, an, an exception as well. Because Bolivia, Colombia, El Salvador, Ecuador, all these countries, they, they forbid um, nuclear weapons and nuclear waste. And, and that's really interesting. Although this movement, uh, we can say that this movement is relatively new. So, and, and that's a very, very interesting topic. Uh, so let's go. So uh, the constituent, it's, up, it's between two, two important moments. Uh, the moment where Brazil decides to have like an indigenous uh, nuclear program, and the moment after the constituent when Brazil decides to enjoy the, the treat from non-proliferation in 1997. So between these, these two periods, uh, a, lo a lot of things happen, and especially in, on the constituency. So uh, let's go. Can, Okay, uh, yeah, let me read. Uh, the union shall have the power to operate nuclear energy service and facilitates of any nature. So it says that it's a, it's a monopoly of the union. They are, are the only ones that can deal with nuclear energy. And all, all nuclear activity within the national territory shall only be admitted for peaceful purpose and subject to approve by the National Congress. This is an interesting topic because uh, when they say subject to approval by the National Congress, they don't say pre-approval. And one of the discussions during the constituency was uh, that, that some constituents wanted to put like pre-approval. So it would change everything because no project would be able to, to go on without going to the Congress first and be scrutinized first. But the way uh, the article is, is, is written, it means that it can be, it can be approved after. So, one more, please. Uh, just remembering the time, this was the time where like Chico Mendes was uh, a Brazilian environmentalist, the, the most famous one. He was like internationally known. He was uh, receiving like a lot of prize worldwide. And it was, that was a very important moment for the Amazon and for the environment. And I think that was the time as well when the, the singer Sting came to Brazil and discussed a lot of, a lot of uh, environmental problems. One more, please. Uh, that's Lady Das Neves. She was the, the first person that died uh, because of the, the, the uh, the Cesium accident in Goiânia, and that's the book of Fernando Gabeira. Fernando Gabeira, uh, is still alive. He's one of the uh, founders of the Green Party in Brazil, and the Green Party was one of the main uh, main voices against nuclear energy at that time. And 
Yeah, so he, he, came to, he came to Goiânia, he wrote the book, and it, it was like the, the big, biggest uh, hydrological accident in the world. If you go to Vienna nowadays, they will say, oh, Goiânia, the biggest uh, in, the, in the United Nations. So, yeah, it's really bad because I'm from Goiânia as well, and then when you go there, like your city is known for, for that. But, but yeah, they, they have like a, a reference to Goiânia there. And one more, please, Professor. Oh, yeah, that, those are the demonstrations in New York, um, like with, with hundreds of thousand people. And one more. And yeah, this is an interesting finding. So uh, Lula nowadays is not against uh, nuclear energy anymore. So he's, he's uh, trying to help Brazil to have like the, the nuclear submarine. But at that time, he was one of the, one of the uh, proposers for, um, uh, to banish uh, nuclear energy. And, and among Lula, there was a, a, a lot of people, Eduardo Suplicy, I guess, and other, other uh, constituents. So uh, sometimes people forget that Lula was a constituent, but he was, and after that, he just ran for, for president. And yeah, and it's interesting because uh, what he proposed here, it's much more uh, restrict than what was uh, accepted later. And, and that's, an, that's a, a topic that, that, I, that I, I like to discuss about the constituent. Because from like a first perspective, it looks like that, okay, the leftists, they were like against nuclear energy, and um, the, the, the government, they were like uh, pro-nuclear energy. But that's not very easy, uh, that's, that's not really, really like that. So, for example, Leonel Brizola, he was pro-nuclear energy, and he was one of the, one of the biggest voices on the opposition. And, and there were, there were, there were uh, people from the former ARENA, the party of the, the, the military party, that were like against nuclear energy. So uh, I, I believe uh, that the, the point was, the topic was much more about uh, a new urban left that were like against nuclear energy, uh, against the nationalists that were like pro um, nuclear energy as a way of like uh, defending the country um, technology, that defending the country uh, ability to, 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 to develop this energy. So it's, it was not really about uh, right or left, even though uh, many of the, of the politicians we know nowadays, they, they were like against nuclear energy at, at that time. And one more. Ah, yes, it's, uh, the constituent was a uh, huge discussion and the, it was really complicated even to vote how they would vote the things. So uh, the, first, uh, the first draft of their constituents there, there was more than 500 articles. So uh, there was a big dispute to, to vote how it, would, uh, how it would work. And end of the day, uh, there was like uh, the, the relatores, uh, how do I say relatores in English? Uh, the rep uh, reporters, uh, they, they were the ones with more power in deciding uh, uh, if like a a, a, amend, a, a amendment could go further or not. And, and yeah, but at the end of the constituent, the most, the most important uh, vote was uh, about like Fab, Fabio Feldman uh, amendment. And, and at, at that point, uh, Feldman made like a very, very soft uh, proposal uh, to to ban nuclear energy, and it didn't pass. So it, it had like 168 uh, votes pro 
and 223 against. And one of the main uh, topics in the discussion was the fear that Brazil would be again would be without uh, medical uh, facilities and medical machines that were operated by radioisotopes. So uh, the constituents from the north and northeast and and like more like north of Brazil, they they talked pro uh, nuclear energy and pro nuclear technology at the time and this and this helped a lot the the nuclear energy not to be prohibited in Brazil but in my perspective one of the things that helped helped like the the nuclear energy in Brazil the most was a report by Hex Nazare Alves uh, at the time working at Kinen and Hex Nazare Alves he was uh, called at the constituent at the beginning of it. I think it was uh, May 87, uh, May 6, 87. And, and he was called because there was like a, a, an investigation going on about the, the accounts. The, there was this uh, idea that the nuclear problem was spending too much. Uh, so it was like the Delta accounts. So they they asked him to come and to and to give um, uh, an explanation to to tell why why the nuclear problem program was being so expensive, why they were why they were they were not like uh, putting the money in other in other things. And then Hex Nazare he made like a very a very passionate uh, defense of nuclear energy, nuclear technology, and he showed uh, the main aspects of nuclear uh, technology as agriculture, um, um, health, and, and, and other aspects like military and everything, and he said that Brazil uh, was not aiming to have a a bomb that was that that would not happen, and it looked like that he convinced the people because because uh, everything I, I researched about this about this session said that he I, it turned out to to help him a lot, and but then after. Uh, one of the main main discussions when Sazio happened in Goiânia was first the fear, because people were so scared. Uh, nowadays, it's it's easy to talk about, but at the time, just imagine people were arriving in your city with like using a lot of uh, big clothes and masks and everything, and people were being secluded in the in the gymnasiums. And and it was a very uh, it's a very strong uh, mobilization by the army and by by everybody and there was not really good communication with the people and and no nobody knew anything about it just just imagine like people people could imagine what was going on and and then after the problem in Goiânia. There was another discussion, where to put the waste, uh, because there was, there was no place to put the waste. So they started like, discussing about like, uh, opening a place in the nor Northeast, and then uh, the representatives of Northeast, they start to say, no, like, you've been prejudicial. Why, why are you wanting to put like, the, the waste here? And then some people talked about like, uh, putting it in the um, in Serra do Cachimbo Hole, where, where the military developed like the, the place for, for the tests. And uh, Cacique Raoni, one of the, the, the indigenous leaders at the time, like, and in, 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 even nowadays, he said no as well, because if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's, this is the place where, where the Tapajó River uh, flows and it's an um, in indigenous reserve, 
And end of the day, they decide to uh, create the place in Abadiania, Abadia de Goiás. And, and yes, uh, it, 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 it is there now. And like, I think all of you, you, you were here like before, but it's, it's a very problematic thing. And, and there was like a lot, of, a lot of discussion in the media, even though uh, the preoccupation was much more about like Goiânia and the accident than the, than the hole in itself. People were not really worried about it. I think Goiânia was, uh, was scarier than, than, than the hole in itself. Uh, and this is a Miller, uh, in quanto, yeah, and uh, one next, please. And in 1991, uh, Fernando Collor, he symbolically closed uh, the place, and he, he had like very strong positions against nuclear energy, and, and one more. And before, like in 88, Sarney and Alphonsine, Alphonsine showed the cooperation. And this is one of the other topics that uh, I think that also helped the nuclear program in Brazil, because one of the main international fears was about like a nuclear race between Brazil and Argentina. And uh, Sarney make it clear that there was no nuclear race between Brazil and Argentina, and that in fact the two the two countries would cooperate to to fiscalize each other. And in 1991, the agents ABAC was formed with with this purpose. And, and yeah, I think I think that's all. I hope I, I was not too too quick. <laughs> and. And yes, I think that the, the, main, the main topic is to understand that nuclear energy um, managed to, to, uh, to put like all the society to discuss uh, the, this, uh, this situation. And it was not a matter of right and left. And it was much more a matter of, um, of environmentalists and, and nationalists and also also it's interesting how um, what was happening in the world uh, outside Brazil uh, it's how, how it impacts the country because it's it's also a thing Brazil took longer to have its its nuclear program if it had it before maybe uh, the the civil society scrutiny would be would be not as strong as it was in '88 because in '88 people were already uh, getting uh, against nuclear energy. Italy had already uh, uh, forbidden nuclear energy in the country, and there was a lot of discussions ar around. But in Brazil, it was just happening. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Ricardo, for a fascinating uh, talk. Um, now I'll hand over to our final speaker on this afternoon's panel, uh, Carlo. I will be giving a paper entitled The 1986 Goldenberg Proposal to Give Up the Option of Atomic Explosives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luc André. It's great uh, that I have the opportunity to, to present this piece of, of research that I think is uh, connected to the other two presentations made until now. Uh, if uh, whether uh, Renata dealt with uh, the period from uh, 1988 and until 19, uh, uh, until 2016, and Ricardo dealt with the, all the debate within the um, within the uh, Constituent Assembly, uh, I I'll do a step back for dealing with uh, a a quite unknown or little known episode of the connection between uh, uh, democratization and debate over the future of uh, nuclear energy in Brazil and over the possibility of uh, uh, scientists, in this case nuclear scientists, but also concerned uh, academics uh, about uh, one of the key issues in uh, for the uh, 
energy future and for security future of the country, but in this case also for uh, selling a new image of Brazil right after the end of the military regime. So in this, uh, in this presentation, I'll talk about uh, uh, the 19, actually 85 uh, proposal uh, that uh, Jose Goldenberg, one of the main uh, nuclear physicists in Brazil, or the well more known nuclear physicist in Brazil, made directly to uh, President uh, uh, Jose Sarney, who has been uh, elected as vice president in the first uh, indirect but democratic election of the new Brazilian president of the democratic rule in 1985, and uh, Sarney became the the president in, in March 1985. So I will deal with uh, uh, an episode of micro history, let's say, in, at the very beginning of, uh, of uh, uh, the uh, Brazilian history of the new democratic rule, of what is known New Republic. But who's Joseph Goldenberg and why is is important as nuclear physicist? Why is important for the civil society? Why is he was the possible he, he was able to have a direct access to the president of uh, of republic? Well, Jose Goldenberg he is uh, now I think 93 or 94. Is uh, uh, was born in 1928 and was one I think of the first students of nuclear physics. Uh, or one of the first genera of the first generation belongs of the, to the first generation of nuclear physics at the University of São Paulo, and he, he began to do uh, research in the early 50s, late 40s. So he is uh, a well-known Brazilian nuclear physicist. And uh, during the 70s, when he was professor of nuclear physics at the University of São Paulo, he was one of the critical voices against the Brazilian West German nuclear deal. Uh, it was quite critical above all of the costs of, uh, uh, of uh, all the deal. It was skeptical about the need of this deal and it was quite uh, skeptical also of the technological choice. So we were in the period of opening of the military regime. Uh, we were in 1975 to 1977 when uh, Goldenberg was particularly active in, this, uh, in his criticism. And uh, uh, in this period of transition to, democra to democracy, uh, his, uh, his opinion was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, quite uh, important. Uh, above all because, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I, I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not sharing my, my presentation. Here we are. Here we are, yes. And uh, Goldenberg, yes, was uh, considered also an important voice uh, for a, an assessment of the nuclear program, even if we were in a military regime. So it was sent, for example, to West Germany, along with uh, uh, Jose Israel Vargas, who was another prominent scientist in that moment, to assess the enriching pro, uh, uh, uranium enrichment progress, uh, enriching process that uh, West Germany was supposed to transfer to, to Brazil. Uh, it was sent there directly by President Geisel, who was, uh, uh, it was not the last president, it was the fourth president of the military regime. And he sent a report to, to President Geisel telling him that uh, the labs actually were dusty and that uh, the technology was not was completely ineffective so in this case we see how important was also the opinion of uh, of an, uh, of, an, of a known nuclear scientist also for a first assessment of a, a nuclear program that it was uh, in its first years of life if we think a nuclear program structure for the production of nuclear energy but uh, uh, his, uh, his importance is also is connected to the fact that uh, he has been the chairman of the Brazilian Society of Physics from 1975 to 1979, so he was the representative of uh, a scientific society. And then he became also the president, the chairman of the Brazilian Society for the Progress of, uh, of Science, that in that specific moment was probably one of the few places in Brazil, but specifically from 1979 to 1981, when there was after the amnesty in, uh, in Brazil, it was one places where it was possible to talk more than in, in others. So 
It's important also that Kodebengi was one of the, an important voice of a scientific community that uh, has also this, uh, uh, this, uh, this kind of weight uh, of, uh, of importance that he can also use in front of the, uh, of the, of the political power even during the, the military regime. And then he became the president of the University of Sao Paulo. So he was involved continuously in the limited public debate about nuclear energy, if it existed a public debate. But it was one of the exponents of the, from academia that uh, pushed for a more direct involvement in nuclear energy. In that case, it's important to say that uh, Jose Goldberg here in, in the, in the, at the beginning of the 80s was not the same Goldenberg that we saw in the last picture of Ricardo's presentation in the, yes, the last picture when he was uh, beside uh, uh, Fernando Collor. It was not against uh, the possibility of Brazil to become autonomous from the nuclear point of view for producing nuclear energy. It was in favor of autonomy, but it was in favor of uh, an effective form of energy that will, could be free also of uh, suspicions, that could make also Brazil free of suspicions. We can use a term right now. It could be considered in favor for a Brazil capable to, to produce nuclear energy uh, by itself, uh, but not uh, a, a country that uh, should be projected to produce nuclear weapons. So it, it was part of this kind of generation of scientists in that moment, because if we compare to other moments in history, he, he became like one of the main exponents of the anti-nuclear energy uh, prospects. So it's, it's important to do this kind of, uh, of caveat in this moment, because uh, the nuclear problem, or the nuclear program, of course, was scrutinized, or, or it could be one of the objects of scrutiny of the democratization, because uh, uh, one of the goals of Brazil's democratic government, uh, of course, we know that by the memories or by the declaration of Takreda Neves, that should be the, the first president, but died right after the, the possible inauguration, was to keep the nuclear program alive. And uh, this led also, and also this strange transition, and the, 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 the strange factor was that the, his vice president was actually one of the leaders of the former party that ruled the country after, uh, during the military regime. They continued the, the so-called parallel secret nuclear program. They continued also the civilian nuclear programs. And uh, of course, Goldenberg uh, was one of the main exponents of criticism from the civil society towards the nuclear projects. Let's remember that one of the main characters also of democratization, of, of openings, openness in Brazil was the fact that uh, at the State University of Campinas, that's the second major university in the country, and one with the uh, I don't know if I'm exaggerating, but, but with the best, or with the, the uh, most well farni uh, furnished uh, department of physics of the country, they were uh, they hosted the Congress of Pagwash in that uh, in that moment, and one of the main concerns were, was uh, uh, the fact that Brazil could be engaged in a nuclear rivalry with uh, with Argentina in that moment because both of them had uh, secret projects. Argentina announced in 1983 that uh, it was able to enrich uranium, and Brazil was keeping on with. Uh, a secret nuclear program that was uh, uh, being announced by the Brazilian press. So in that moment also the democratization led from 1979 to 1985. Uh, the, there was the possibility to have a clear position against nuclear power plants. We saw the case of Sape in Angra dos Reis. Uh, we had opposition against the secret PNES project. There were rumors about the existence of uh, projects for making a bomb, but they were about, uh, the first evidence also of the presence of, of nuclear uh, test sites, uh, uh, even if it uh, was uh, uh, impossible to understand why there was a test site and not a nuclear bomb. So there was uh, the possibility of a strong impact also of the criticism connected to the democratization process. As we saw this morning,
there was also an influence of the international green movement, green movement that was quite str strong in Europe and in the US, as we saw by the cases of the anti-nuclear movements in the global north. And exists, existed, of course, a concern about a possible nuclear rivalry with Argentina. To be short, uh, Goldenbergi, because of all the concerns, was able to send a letter to President Sarney to send a request. Uh, two months after he, uh, Sarney inaugurated as a new president, and uh, he made a proposal in June, July 1985 uh, about the need to eliminate uh, the international perception of uh, the Argentine and Brazilian nuclear projects as a threat to international security. Uh, we were in a period uh, when uh, many countries of the global south of the third world, like India, Argentina, Mexico, they were talking the, rhetorically about uh, nuclear disarmament, also India, even despite the 10 years later smiling Buddha. But uh, what uh, Goldenberg proposed was uh, uh, a common Argentine-Brazilian statement. Uh, Sarney should commit uh, and uh, there should be a common declaration in which it should be clear that uh, uh, Argentina and Brazil had no intention to produce nuclear weapons and uh, they should improve forms of mutual cooperation, improve the dialogue that they began in 1980 during the military regime. So this was a sort of revolutionary proposal a few months before the 1985 NPT RevCon when uh, Brazil and Argentina were targets also of criticism by the, the rest of the country. This, uh, this proposal was uh, uh, thought to uh, eliminate the, uh, any perception of threat of the two countries, but also for deepening the cooperation between the two countries. So it, it, was, it shows also the importance of the scientists in proposing something uh, uh, new to the president for resolving international disputes and uh, for proposing uh, possible solutions also to the scientific cooperation between uh, uh, the two neighbors. The proposals apparently failed because uh, uh, the foreign ministry that was in charge also for nuclear diplomacy discarded the proposal uh, and uh, but uh, and it was before the NPT Revcom, as I told you before, but also before the first meeting that should happen between President Alfonsin from Argentina and Sarney from, from Brazil. They should also talk about nuclear energy. But Brazil's reaction was the creation of the zone of peace and cooperation in the South Atlantic in 1986. And also there was the beginning of the first talks, but it, it's low beginning of the first talks of the Argentine-Brazilian nuclear relationship. My conclusion is that uh, where the democratization is clear, there was a growing opposition to the nuclear projects. It was not, of course, a mass movement, but uh, like in Europe. But there were, there were uh, associations that were protesting or proposing alternatives. And uh, uh, this also shows that uh, there was the inclusion of the civil society of people not involved in the decision-making process of a talks of a nuclear energy in this discussion of the future of the country. And uh, of course, these are the first signals, I think the Goldenberg proposal is the first of several initiatives of connection between the state and the civil society because we can think about this proposal by Goldenberg and then also the creation of a Blue Ribbon Commission to assess the nuclear program, led by Israel Vargas, who was a scientist, appointed by President Sarney, but it was an, a first involvement of people from the civilian society, even if the, some military were involved in that. And of course, all the talks at the Constituent Assembly. So this was just uh, a, a piece for uh, showing uh, uh, how the democratization process also included the voices of, uh, of scientists and also uh, as nuclear energy was, was part of it, even it was not, of course, central. But thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
very much, Carlo, uh, for an excellent paper. So I think we have uh, 15 minutes or so um, for questions. So I think we can open the floor. Uh, if you have any questions, I think we'll just wait for the, the microphone to reach you. Um, I think I can perhaps kick things off as, as people collect their thoughts um, with a question for Carlo. Um, so you'd mentioned the, uh, the Pugwash conference that, that happened uh, sort of at, at that key moment in, in South America. And I was wondering, was Goldenberg um, either sort of influenced by or in touch with some of these other organizations of, I mean, w whether it was Pugwash or, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of the Federation of Atomic Scientists in the US, Scientists Against Nuclear Arms in, uh, in the UK. Um, there was uh, USPID in Italy, the, the Union of Scientists for Disarmament. Um, but in this period, in the early 1980s, we see a, a proliferation of, of groups of scientists um, mobilizing against uh, nuclear, nuclear issues. So I, I was wondering, how far that factored into the, the Goldenberg proposal, if at all. I don't know if there are other questions, also in Portuguese. <laughs> so we can, uh, great, sh shall we collect a few or? Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. think it, it will be better. Uh, sure, yes, go ahead, please. Eu queria fazer uma pergunta para a professora Renata. É, eu achei muito interessante a exposição do, da mesa. Obrigada pela oportunidade de estar aqui assistindo. E eu gostei muito da, da fala dela e aprendi muitas coisas interessantes, mas eu fiquei com uma dúvida no final. Porque, embora ela fale sobre... A sua pesquisa, basicamente, era sobre é, ver como combinar essa produção nuclear com a democracia e como é, a, era a função, entender a função dos atores políticos. E, no fim, você fala que teve um debate público, só que as pessoas em si, elas meio que fugiam do tema quando elas chegavam lá para debater, ou elas faziam é, perguntas que não eram tanto de interesse, que não tinham um foco tão grande naquilo, e iam aumentando as áreas. E tem toda a questão do, do sigilo em, em assuntos nucleares, e... No final da sua fala, eu fiquei na dúvida tipo, se a senhora seria a favor de uma dessecuritização dos assuntos nucleares, no caso. tipo Tirar os assuntos nucleares é, do sigilo, desse âmbito político e mais secreto, e abrir para as pessoas, para que elas pudessem entender melhor e, assim, talvez, é, entender melhor o, o foco, ou se era somente ah, continua com alguns assuntos nucleares do modo que estão, com todo o sigilo que tem por cima, e o esclarecimento das pessoas, o debate público, ele teria um, um outro viés. É, foi mais ou menos assim a minha dúvida. Great, thanks. And I think there was one more question at the back. Um, so maybe we, we can collect that one and then uh, we'll put uh, for those to our speakers. Portuguese or English? <laughs> Português, então, minha língua nativa. É, apesar do professor Carlos ter comentado né, que a comunidade científica, em 1985, já estava ganhando um pouco mais de espaço nessa discussão, eu me pergunto se a gente ainda... Porque eu vi que a Argentina, recentemente, é, fez uma parceria com a China né, para a construção de uma terceira usina nuclear, de energia nuclear, quarta, é, então, assim, e o Brasil pare, parece que ainda está bastante ainda cético, né? Não é que eu defenda, né? Eu estou, na verdade, só perguntando se há uma extrema politização do assunto no Brasil. Great, thanks everyone uh, for your questions. Uh, so I, I think we can let the speakers answer maybe in, in the order in which they spoke. So if uh, if Renata, if you'd like to respond uh, in the first instance. Obrigada pela pergunta. Eu vou responder em português, porque eu acho que fica mais claro. Né? É, o que eu estava falando sobre o debate público é que as instâncias formais para esse debate público, elas acontecem como um requisito legal do licenciamento ambiental. E o licenciamento ambiental, ele é um processo bastante específico, voltado a um empreendimento específico, vamos supor, um repositório para combustível nuclear utilizado. E aí as pessoas vão participar da consulta pública e elas trazem questões muito mais amplas do que o empreendimento específico. 
elas trazem questões sobre é, escolhas é, de política pública, sobre desenvolvimento sustentável, sobre acesso à saúde, educação, há várias coisas que vão além do escopo do empreendimento sendo debatido. E uma maneira de interpretar isso, esse... É, esse desencontro entre o que as pessoas querem debater e o empreendimento específico, aquele processo específico de licenciamento ambiental, pode ser que é porque não existem instâncias mais amplas para o input da sociedade, né, para a discussão mais ampla da sociedade. Então, o único espacinho que essas pessoas têm para trazer esse tipo de reflexão, pelo menos enquanto eu estava estudando isso, né, que foi até 2016, era o licenciamento ambiental. E fica a cargo do Ibama ter que lidar com todas essas demandas. Então, esse era como se fosse um, um, um mismatch, né? um, um, um desencontro entre é, a vontade de participar, de, de compartilhar é, demandas, né? e aquele processo tão definido, específico, sobre um empreendimento apenas. Então, era nesse sentido que eu estava falando. Sobre a questão da dessecuritização, e entra um pouco né, é, a questão da, da, do, do campo democrático e da despolitização da energia nuclear, ela é interessante porque eu senti, assim, é, existem, deveria, em, em teoria, né, você tem algumas etapas do... do é, combustível nuclear, que são menos securitizadas que outras, né? Por exemplo, você pensaria que a geração de energia nuclear, a geração de eletricidade, é algo assim que no nível de, de debate público seria um, algo mais aberto do que, por exemplo, o desenvolvimento né, do, do submarino nuclear. Então, assim, tem diferentes graus de nuclearidade e diferentes aberturas para a participação e para o debate público. É... Mas em todas elas tem uma questão que é, é, fica mais complicado, que é o fato mesmo da tecnologia nuclear. E talvez seja uma questão do Brasil, pode ser, mas é também uma questão da história da energia nuclear, né? Que a energia nuclear ficou conhecida pelos bombardeios de Hiroshima e Nagasaki. Então, isso está marcado na trajetória da, 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 da tecnologia nuclear mesmo. Eu acho que é, em todos os... Assim, é necessário desmistificar isso e é necessário ter iniciativas em que a gente possa conversar mais sobre isso, em que as pessoas possam aprender mais, possam perguntar, possam trocar. E aí eu não digo só as pessoas, os cidadãos comuns, eu digo também os parlamentares. É, vendo, assim, acompanhando como esse assunto é debatido dentro né, da, da, da Câmara e do Senado, há muito desconhecimento também por parte dos parlamentares. Né? Então... É, Nesse sentido, eu acho que a gente ainda tem muito para caminhar, é, para ter mais participação da sociedade, mas também uma participação ativa do, dos parlamentares. Espero que tenha ficado um pouco mais claro agora. Obrigada. Thanks very much, Renata. Uh, I'll hand over to Ricardo. Okay. Então, sobre a questão da, das discussões, né? Uh, pública sobre sobre o tema nuclear. Acho que o Matias Spector está com umas pesquisas interessantes, né, sobre sobre como que a questão nuclear é vista pela sociedade. É, eu acho que nesse último governo a gente aprendeu um pouco sobre o risco é, da gente da gente não debater esse tipo de questão, da gente não ter uma uma discussão uma discussão pública forte sobre o tópico. Então, é, eu acho que isso ensinou muito para a gente, não só sobre a questão nuclear, mas sobre todos os tópicos, de como que a gente tem que é, ocupar o, de, o lugar dos debates, a gente tem que ocupar o lugar da discussão, como a professora Suzane estava falando aqui, hoje mais cedo. Se a gente não ocupar esse debate, se a gente não entender, é, a gente vai ficar à mercê de esperar alguma coisa que, que a gente está achando que vai... Que vai vindo do céu, que vai ouvir alguém explicar para a gente tudo o que está acontecendo, e muitas vezes não vai. Então, então é isso, eu acho que, o, eu acho que a gente tem que ocupar os, os espaços do debate. É, eu, pessoalmente, não sou totalmente contra a energia nuclear, eu acho que, eu acho que é, é, é melhor você saber do que você não saber. 
Então, acho que é importante o Brasil dominar o ciclo de combustível, mas eu acho que a gente tem que ter, a gente tem que ter é, um espaço aberto para essas discussões, como que está acontecendo aqui hoje. E a gente tem que conseguir é, manter esse debate, a gente tem que conseguir entender o que está acontecendo, até para a gente saber quais são as opções. Né? Então, por mais que a gente vá por opções ruins, mas pelo menos que a gente sabe o que a gente está fazendo. Thanks very much, and uh, I'll hand over to Carlo. Thank you, thank you, Luke. Uh, so about uh, the possible connection of influence of other association abroad in uh, uh, Ingoldenberg's uh, attitude, actually I don't know, because uh, I don't know if it was influenced by uh, the contemporary talk, talks uh, for the, from the Pagwish Conference, uh, from the Federation of American Scientists, and so on. Uh, I can presume that yes, because uh, it was an academic involved also in international debate. And uh, after that, you evolved you in the 90s. Uh, so for this, I can infer that uh, it was engaged also in the international debate, because in, in the 90s, it was particularly active also in, uh, uh, in Pagwash, but also in all the other in initiative for a, a world uh, uh, free from nuclear weapons and uh, also for discussing alternatives for alternative forms of, uh, of energy. It was also in the panel for the elimination of fissile material. Uh, it was one of the chairmen for, for a while. But something that, of course, I should explore more. What, as far as I know, the rest of the scientific community, it was a tiny scientific community, uh, of opposition to the to the nuclear program, they were part of those of those mov movements. Uh, among the organizer of the Powers Pagwash Conference, who gave uh, uh, a very critical uh, presentation against the Brazilian nuclear program in that moment, was a physicist from the University of Rio de Janeiro, who was Luis Pingeli Rosa. That it was uh, since the 70s i think was one of the most critical voices of the of the nuclear of the nuclear program so uh, uh, the community the scientific community until at least or many nuclear scientists that also participated in the public <coughs> debate and they mean the public debate in the newspapers in that moment uh, it was clear that uh, they were not uh, they were were was not cohesion until at least uh, the public revelations about the existence of the nuclear uh, test shafts in uh, uh, in uh, in Sara do Cachimbo. Before they were, uh, they, many of them thought that uh, all the dangers from the secret programs were just rumors and were not uh, were non-existing. Uh, this is clear also by the declarations they they gave uh, and the different declaration from the mid uh, eighty four until the mid-86. Uh, so uh, it's, it's something that I would like to explore more, uh, maybe interviewing uh, uh, Goldenberg himself. Thank you. We, we have a couple of minutes left. If we have one last question, uh, I think we may have time for it. Otherwise, um, I think we can wrap up the panel, but before we do, I think we can uh, thank our speakers uh, one last time for three excellent presentations.